All right. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna put them on silent. Hold on, we had, we just had a shooting. Hold on. Two shootings. Hold on, let me send these out. Please follow up with next action steps. Thank you. We just had two separate shootings within a few minutes of each other, so I had to send them out to the team. If any of these turn into a homicide, I will have to leave. Kevin gets a call like immediately. As soon as somebody gets shot, as soon as they get to the police, the police, it's like he get it. So I'm Kevin. I do passionate work close to my heart. Violence prevention for the city of Oakland. I'm a violence prevention coordinator. We just get the information. It won't have a name. It'll just say the address, this, that, and other. Generally say gender, male. But oftentimes, the solving rate um, for law enforcement is low on black and brown homicides. So a lot of uh, our people, our youth in this, in communities, flatland communities like this one, often feel the need to do their own retaliation. Our goal, unfortunately, I wish we could get ahead. This is one of my dreams is to stop shooting A. But we've gotten really good at stopping shooting B. When we first started this work, it was actually West Oakland. Now West Oakland geographically is probably one third the size of the east. The east is huge. Now it is the most stress beat in the city of Oakland. Lots of drama in the town. Don't make it right, but that's part of the issue. And so a part of our job is to build relationships with these youngsters, maintain these relationships by following up and following through. As long as you be authentic and also, you know, and, and, and timely with these youngsters, you can keep healthy relationships with them through thick and thin. They'll check in with you when times are rough, when, when before the bullets start flying. And the goal is to have that relationship so you can tap in when this area goes hot. It's perfect stuff. Let's get in the middle of this. Who can we bring to the table to slow this oh, down? This here. I need this myself. No, <laughs> I grew up in Oakland. This part of the area is where we hung out a lot. Now those uh, lines are pretty much hard drawn and our kids are trapped in the very neighborhoods they grew up in. But when you look like this duck in this pond, and typically for our kids, that's the earliest 12, all the way up to their mid-20s, that's the duck in the pond. Unfortunately, whether you want to belong to something or not, you can be trapped as if you do. So I found out that through me drinking or smoking weed gave me a little courage. You know, it's hood mad. So I started off using, like I said, recreational because it gave me a little courage. But then, you know, lo and behold, you get sucked into this behavior. We used to sell drugs right, right where we're sitting. One of the houses we were um, doing stuff out of was being watched for quite a while. I didn't know that. Um, nobody knew it. That led to an arrest that was the start of it for me where they caught me with a sawed off shotgun, but they let me go. I bailed out. Unfortunately for me, I had a couple of different cases. You know, law enforcement has their gears, which is handcuffs and um, jail cells. When I was incarcerated, I, I, I did wrong. I needed to be incarcerated. I don't believe, you know, for as long as all the time in and out that, that I've done, but I think that um, giving these people another opportunity besides the institutions that have been set up to fix a problem that ain't been fixed yet. I think it's a hell of a deal for us to be able to hold that flag and be honored to do that work with the loved ones. Monday marked Oakland's somber milestone, the 100th homicide of the year. Breaking news in East Oakland where the CHP is investigating a shooting. This is a live look from Sky 7 over the scene along interstate. Oakland police investigating a shootout that left two people dead and left another wounded. Officers responded to the incident on 84th Avenue in East Oakland. That's near Castlemont High School around 1245 this afternoon. One person died at the scene. The other died at the hospital a short time later. Ms. Highland, go ahead. Uh, 3105. This is a 28-year-old male. She has three wounds to the abdomen, two wounds to the right arm. GCS-12. As a trauma center, our responsibility is to save lives. Our, our responsibility is also to prevent injuries. We have a fair amount of gunshot wound victims, so we have an injury prevention program that um, is tailored toward that. I'm going to walk fast. Okay. okay. 
What we try to do here is recognize and understand the circumstances that brought the person here, take care of the patient, but when we are ready for them to go safely back into the community, we think about that. If it's someone who has mentioned to us that they were involved in drugs or gangs or anything of that nature and that they want to change that, they'll say, I don't want to go back to that same neighborhood. I don't want to go home to that. But our biggest concern is really assisting patients when they leave the hospital. And, and not just the patient, but the patient's loved ones as well. So we have a strong partnership with the City of Oakland and their community resources to have folks come to the hospital and do a bedside visit. We go to the hospital, then we get a chance to meet the families. We get a chance to talk with the young loved one, oftentimes while we have their attention bedside. And then we get a chance at that time, if we don't already have a relationship, to start building a relationship. And then the goal when they come home is to maintain it, develop it, and then perfect and keep that family system in our embrace to help that youngster not retaliate and or be another victim of violence. We really have been utilizing the City of Oakland Violence Coordinator, Kevin Grant. The patient may feel more comfortable talking to somebody in the community that is kind of aware of what's going on um, with the violence. What's up, folks? You good? Yeah. Getting around OK? No. Boy, we'll have to post them. <laughs> How many uh, staples? Did, dang, that's a lot. Of, wow. This is what your second time or third time being hit? Third time. Third time being shot. I don't know if you remember what you said at how you're like, Kev, I'm ready for this <laughs> now. I'm ready to do something different like me. <laughs> well, ain't nothing fun about getting shot at. My name is Jamar Scott. What I did for a living, I was uh, working at a park, uh, fixing trails and, you know, um, landscaping. This is the first time I got shot right here. You know, basically all the way right here. I was standing outside. Somebody walked up, got out of the car at the corner, walked up and, uh, you know, he shot a couple of times, probably shot like 10 times, 10, 11 times. I didn't know the person who ever shot me, so, you know, I couldn't find out if I was a friend or, you know, somebody associated with somebody else. So, uh, and I ended up having a, a scuffle with somebody else. And I, I kind of beat him up kind of bad. So, you know, I guess he, re he wanted to retaliate. He was shot, but he was on paperwork, what we call paperwork, parole or probation, either or both. Typically with that, you have pending court dates or dates with your parole agent monthly. So first thing we do when we find out, when I go to the hospital, I'm like, loved one, you on paperwork? Yeah, I'm on parole, I'm on probation. I start calling. Hey, probation officer Jay, this is Kevin Grant. I'm at the hospital with one of your parolees and he won't be in the office tomorrow. He's here, and then we have one of our system partners is parole and probation, so they'll be like, okay, Kev, long as you, you know, you let me know. Then at that point, I tell Jamar that I'm be sending updates to A, the courts, which is a system partner of ours, B, parole or probation, right, and anybody else because we're doing what we call criminogenic needs. But other than that, you good? So I gotta go to the grocery store, so. That's like, you know, we be walking around all day like I'm granny in there. <laughs> but get one of those, don't they got them little electric scooters? What store? It's a lot has changed here. It's vi more violence. And now I wish the world was peace, rabbits and flowers and, you know, and, and soft music in the hoods. But unfortunately, you know, there's conflict. But now the, the thing that has changed for the bad, worse is the conflict is now dealt, dealt with the business end of a pistol instead of some fists. Back in my day, I always carried a, a gun, I always had a gun on me, I always fought. We put our guns down here, hold this, and fight. You know, today, that, that's not happening. This is um, in Leavenworth. This is my band. Our band's name was Mandatory Release. These are brothers from all over. And of course, oh love or no love, Oakland in the house. Kevin Cool, as they say. <laughs> these guys right here, we did some really intense, like in the battlefield. Some of these guys, we, we share some really, you know, some real intense things and I love them to death, but um, it's a different kind of situation. Even though there was some love shared here, some great memories here, I shouldn't have been here. 
This is the first time I met my son. I don't think he remembers it, you know, but I do. One hug in, one hug out. So I got to hug him when he got there. The visit must have lasted four or five hours. I got to hug him when he left, two days in a row, because that was only visit weekends in Leavenworth. She spent thousands of dollars to come up there for me to hug my son four times. I had a kid ask me, he said, well, Kev, if you didn't go through that life, you wouldn't be able to help us. You wouldn't be here. If you getting locked up helped you fix your life, you wouldn't be here. This is what happens. The machine takes 10 people in and seven return. If me and you was husband and wife and we had 10 cars and we took them to my loved one and he fixed them and a week later seven of them was broke, how many other cars would we let him fix? None. Because he ain't doing a good job. The Department of Corrections get 10 people in and seven of them return. They're not doing a good job, but they get all the funding to keep fixing us. What works is fixing your damn self. And what is fixing yourself is quit letting them tow you into their yard because they ain't going to fix you. You got to tow yourself into your, your own yard. Who in here in the game has been involved with some risky situations? Who's anybody in here been shot? Okay. Anybody in here uh, witnessed or had some loved ones shot and laid down in the town? Keep your hands up if you know over five people that you know that are dead. Six, seven. I can go generally to 10. I got people who have, you know, the whole wall of t-shirts. Who in here is still with their typical daily life, still putting themselves in harm's way? Keep it real. Okay, so I'm gonna share a story with you that I want you to do. I wanna role play with you, so that's mom. So every day you leave your damn house and you up there up to your antics, your shenanigans, I want you to do this for me, if you don't do it for you. Mom, I love you and I want you to hug and kiss your mother because you might not ever see her again. Right? Because that's what the town delivers. Oakland, Richmond, right? Vallejo. Come on, San Francisco, right? And the mothers are coming to the thing saying, the last thing he told me was he loved me. I just talked to him on the phone. So if you know you playing town business and we know Oakland, Richmond, Blade, we know that that town business includes what? Death. And if you guys know you still jumping in them lanes, could be a gangster and tell your mother goodbye because you might not make it home. Real talk, right? You brave enough to do that every day? Or are you smart enough to stop the behavior? Tired of us brave. I, we, we see the graveyard full of brave. I'm trying to see some smart people who change that dynamic. Mothers ain't supposed to bury their babies. That only happened in wartime. Babies bury their parents. You understand how that works? I take care of all three of my kids from the time they were born. Mariah, Joshua, and Elijah. They're my life. Elijah's your average kid, teenage kid who's trying to find his identity, see where he fits in, also try to meet, I guess, my standards of graduating from high school. The reason why he actually had a social worker was because he was under probation. He used to have the ankle monitor. My son had like a lot of advocates and mentors. One of the social workers said, hey, you know, Kevin Grant is a perfect person for EJ to meet because he does midnight basketball. And I was like, perfect, because EJ loves basketball too. I get a call from the public defender's office. I'm a young lady, a mother whose son was having some issues and we were set to meet up the following week to discuss her son. So unfortunately that week or that weekend, I, I get sick, but I made a point to call um, the mother. We scheduled an appointment. The appointment was on April 17 or April 18. So I called and I said, hey, I'm trying to reach you 
this is Kevin Grant, we were due to hook up, I'm not feeling well. It was interesting because there was no return call. He was at a party in Vallejo and gunfire happened in, you know, at a residence around 12 midnight. My son was pronounced at 12.44 a.m. on April 14th. He was only 15 years old. I, I, I couldn't believe, that's why it's hard for me to be sick. It's hard for me to have something else to do because one day delayed can end like this. I didn't find out till the afternoon when, early afternoon, that I needed to call Vallejo PD because something had happened to Elijah. They didn't give me any inf too much information, any information. I don't know what else I'm supposed to do. Like, do parents just sit down and just wait for their, the detectives to call them back? Like, I, I don't know what happens to all these cases. Like, do people just forget? So we're coming up to two years. Myself and my youngest son had just recently moved out of state. Part of my healing and part of me being a mother to my child is to still take care of him. So I needed to still come here to visit my son so I can dress him up, you know, especially it's the holidays. But it's hard. It really is hard. I don't, I don't feel whole. I, I don't think I'm ever gonna be whole again. My son had a very bright future ahead. He knew what he wanted. We knew what we wanted. My three kids and I had a plan. We really had a plan. And our plan is not complete. I used to, even before I even got shot, I used to be like, you got shot? Oh, call Kev, he about to, oh, we about to figure this out right now. <laughs> but I swear, when I got shot, I, that's when I was like, damn, Kev coming to see me. Me and my best friend, we had just left Bayfair, and we had ended up meeting some of our friends and stuff. We um, stopped at the store and then started walking. And next thing you know, I heard pew, pew, pew. So I looked back, somebody shooting, and they just saw us start running and stuff. Once I got shot, I yelled to everybody, like, I got shot, run. Everybody ran. I called her, like, Mama, where you at? I just got shot. She like, what? The people like made a U-turn, and I thought they was about to come back and shoot me and stuff. I'm on the phone with my mama like this. Mom, they about to, man, they doubling back. Like, I can't even call. Like, you know, like, you about to just go out like this. I remember I was like covering my face up, like, you know, hoping they didn't see me. And then I heard their car go past. I looked up like, mama, they gone. Come get me, come get me. <laughs> Kevin gets a call, like, immediately. My mom calls him, like, Kevin, don't you deal with this type of work? Like, <laughs> and he came, and uh, he was like, what you, you know, like, what you doing? I don't, I don't know, like, nothing. <laughs> I ain't doing nothing but hanging out, I guess. You tried when I first got shot. You tried to get me. Now, I don't know how, but I wiggled, wiggled through. Like, I he thought you had me. I, you almost, I got shot again. I'm like, all right, Kev, right? I really do need to figure this out. Yeah. Kev, right? He being right. Every time 
Every time I when I used to call you, I used to be like, Kev, I should have listened. Kev, Kev, I should have listened. I, I know you said, but I did. Watch this. What would be wrong with you being a mental health support person for this population? Right now? You would be a beast at it. Oh yeah, I know. I, none of the mental health people I know that I've worked with for years ain't been in the they didn't grow up in the hood and they ain't never been shot. They ain't never seen both sides of the game. A lot of kids need a mentor. They need somebody to show them, like I can tell her something and it doesn't register because I'm the mama. You know, mamas don't know nothing. You know, <laughs> they don't know nothing. But let some let Kevin tell her and she'll go, hmm. You know what, Kevin, my mom just said that to me. <laughs> you know, I might need, to, yeah, okay. Look at that smile. Look at that million dollar smile. I, I really be telling people like, Kev, he gonna get the job done. Mm-hmm.